what I want to tell you about today is the, the research in our group, which is always focused on materials with complicated structures. So we like materials that don't have proper crystalline order, materials that have defects, nanostructures, or are sometimes completely amorphous. And uh, in the talk today, I want to actually combine different things. I want to talk about the materials that we're interested in and some recent highlights of, of materials that we try to understand better. Um, and also, I want to talk a bit about the computational tools that we developed that help us actually do that. So it will be a slightly um, unconventional order. I think I'll start with some some materials and then go to the the machine learning methods in, in the end. Um, so when we talk about atomistic materials modeling, the central problem that we want to solve is to figure out the so-called potential energy surface of a material. So we want to know for any given chemical material what its energy is as a function of where the atoms are. Right. So I always draw these wiggly lines. It's quite um, quite cartoon-like. But imagine you you work out the potential energy of the element carbon. You would have diamond in a minimum on this surface, maybe up here. And you would have, for example, a carbon nanotube. This is a, a one-dimensional um, tube of graphite-like atoms rolled into a sheet. Um, these structures we can treat very accurately with quantum mechanical methods. And there's been decades of progress um, developing methods that tell us exactly what is the stability of these structures, what are the forces acting on the atoms. But of course, when you talk to your experimental colleagues, and well, we're based in, a, uh, in an inorganic chemistry laboratory, so we talk quite a lot with people who do experiments in the lab, and they will quickly tell us this is not yet what the real material looks like, right? Real materials have defects, grains are sometimes disordered, and we can't hope to describe the entire potential energy surface using just quantum mechanics. So a class of techniques that's been increasingly popular in the recent years, over 10, 15 years or so, is um, now trying to use machine learning techniques to accelerate this process. The machine learning in general is the science and craft of getting information out of large data sets. And in this case, we have data sets of quantum mechanical computations that we can do. Um, so again, in this kind of cartoon picture on the left, we start with some calculations we've done for small model systems. And uh, I often say this is the first ingredient you need to build accurate atomistic ML models. And our group focuses on the left-hand side of this diagram. So we develop techniques that let you build these data sets in an efficient way. So imagine I can do a couple of calculations, usually a few hundred or a thousand, um, using my quantum mechanical reference method. I do that at selected points right on this surface. I then need some mathematical way to represent the atomic structure. And then I have the actual learning task. This is a supervised machine learning problem. So I know a couple of points, and I want to interpolate this blue line between the points. Once I know what this blue line looks like, and that's what my machine learning model gives me, once I know that, I can make predictions for much more complicated materials and much larger systems. Um, and of course, this has been as a, so there's two foundational papers from uh, Jörg Bela, Michele Pernello from 2007, um, Albert Bartok, Gabor Gianni in Cambridge uh, in 2010. And then since then, of course, the, there has been a rapidly growing community um, in developing these tools. I don't want to talk too much about the right-hand side of this diagram. I do want to kind of advertise here a tutorial paper that we've written a while ago. So this was written with two of my um, PhD students, where we talk a bit about how to, not just how to how these things work, but also how to validate them, how to make sure that they're accurate and reliable, which of course is a big challenge in these machine learning methods, making sure that they do the right thing. Um, so I, I, I just refer you there. Um, I wanted to start with two examples of um, materials that we've been finding quite interesting over time. I said we like amorphous things, so non-crystalline solids. And the one textbook case of this is um, amorphous silicon. So in crystalline silicon, which you may know from solar cells, for example, you've got all the atoms in tetrahedral environments, like in diamond. In amorphous non-crystalline silicon, almost all the atoms are also in tetrahedral environments, like this one here. 
And there's a few that are not, and they're actually very important for the properties of the materials. So for example, this one here is missing one neighbor and um, getting the details right is, is quite hard. So just to give you a sense of proportions and of system sizes, this is a simulation that I've sketched here um, that would contain about 512 atoms. So that's probably the limit at the moment of what you could do with accurate quantum mechanical, um, we call the molecular dynamics simulations. Um, so this is this is very computationally expensive to do. Um, in 2018, we um, wrote a first paper on um, basically describing the same system with machine learning methods and checking that it looks okay. At the time, those were 4,000 atoms. They were great, you know, you can, you can go bigger than this. But of course, if I now draw it to scale, um, we said, what, what if we can go even larger than that? And so what I'm showing you on the right is 100,000 atoms of amorphous silicon in a simulation box. Um, you see, most of the atoms are fourfold connected. They don't have color, but then there are a few coordination defects in red or blue. Um, and again, those are really <clears throat> important to get right. This system was simulated using a machine learned force field at near quantum mechan uh, mechanical accuracy. Um, how this works, we make many of our structure models by simulated quenching from the melt. So we take liquid silicon and we cool it very slowly, which means over many thousand simulation steps. You see here the temperature slowly going down. You see the volume going up as the structure changes from a liquid to an amorphous state. Silicon, like water, freezes when uh, expands when you freeze it. So if you ever put a, a beverage into the freezer and left it there and it expanded, this is what happens. And silicon does the same thing. So you see the volume going up. Atoms stop moving. We go from a high connected um, metallic liquid to the fourfold connected um, amorphous structure. We can analyze the structural properties. So it gets more similar to the diamond type structure. It gets um, locally more favorable where the ordered regions, uh, the uh, solid regions form. Um, we spend quite a lot of time over the years checking that the simulations are valid. And just as one example, the experimental fingerprint of the ordering in this amorphous structure is for the structure factor. You measure it experimentally, and that's from um, the, the black points are from an experimental paper. And the the fingerprint you need to look at is the first sharp diffraction peak. So that that height is actually very, very closely in agreement with experiments. So that gave us confidence that these models are accurate and reliable. Um, now, of course, we could go and build these structures and look at them, but we want to go a step further and understand things that were not clear before. And one of the striking things that we we, we thought quite interesting, um, I'm showing you here in the form of a little video. Um, so people had been studying for a long time what happens to amorphous silicon under pressure. You take the sample and compress it. It changes its properties. It becomes metallic. It starts um, just behaving very differently. And we said, can we, can we mirror that in a simulation? So in this video here, I'm color coding the atoms again by coordination number. Purple is fourfold, like in diamond. And I'm taking the structure, starting at ambient pressure, and then slowly squeezing it um, up to 20 gigapascals. So you see the atoms here wiggling around a little bit. Early on, not very much is happening. So you just see the atoms moving until at some point, if you keep watching the video, you see some high coordinate regions popping up. And suddenly, it does this. It looks very different. If, if you keep watching the video, you see it starts sort of looking completely chaotic. And then over time, you see more and more ordered regions actually growing in this in this structure. And if you look closely, if you um, look here, for example, you see a hexagonal close packing of atoms. And um, for those of you who studied chemistry and had to look at different structure types, this is the um, stack, sort of a 2D hexagonal close packing. If you take 2D hexagonal close pack, stack it A, 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 so you stack the same type on top of each other, you get something called a simple hexagonal um, crystal. And that is exactly what, what people have found experimentally, a silicon five, it's one of the high pressure forms. So we were quite excited to be able to see this process, not just the collapse, but also the, the crystallization, which you can't do with established um, um, empirical simulation tools. So you can go and take the simulation and analyze the sequence of structural transitions. You can also look at the electronic properties. I won't go into detail here. Um, you can take this simulation and analyze, for example, the 
the similarity to the crystalline phases. So you see the simple hexagonal here growing from the disordered phase. You can look at energetics. What we are um, using here, we call the local enthalpy um, or local excess enthalpy. As you see, those regions that are crystalline are more favorable. So they're darker in this picture than um, the disordered ones, which makes sense because the crystal is thermodynamically favored. Um, I sometimes say, of course, you know, silicon under very high pressure is a relatively specialized topic, and some people might be interested directly in silicon, but many other people might be looking at other materials that are polycrystalline, that are nanocrystalline, that have interfaces, grains. So I think this is also an example of what kind of material simulations we can do um, these days that just were not possible a few years ago. Um, from this very sort of fundamental topic, I want to go to a second example that's more closely linked to application that's about um, memory materials so these used to be used in um, optical discs um, now in, in electronic devices people use them to make um, uh, flexible displays all sorts of practical applications uh, these are germanium antimony telluride um, phases which have a crystalline form this is germanium telluride looks almost like rock salt um, it's shiny it's conducting it encodes the digital one in a device and take this crystalline phase, switch it using electric or laser pulses to form a very disordered phase on the right, um, which as you see, looks looks completely different, has a very different type of structure and has different properties. So it's not conducting and it's quite dull. And so you can encode um, ones and zeros with this kind of material. Um, actually, these compounds have been for several years, um, I think some of the forefront applications of of machine learning driven modeling. So the first machine learned potentials for GTE um, was reported by Gabriele Sosso and um, uh, Marco Bernasconi um, in 2012, so a long time ago. And they already showed very impressive simulations of GTE. There's then other um, potentials. There's um, work from Stephen Elliott's group at Cambridge making a potential for um, germanium 2 antimony 2 tellurium 5 and so on. So there's been a lot of progress in the field um, of, of phase change memories driven by machine learning modeling. Um, what we did here, and this is um, work that was just published from uh, Yujing Zhou's PhD project, is in close collaboration with colleagues at uh, Xi'an Jiaotong, uh, with whom we've been working for, for, for a long time. Um, what we did here is we said we want to build a machine learning potential for this whole range of compounds, from germanium telluride to antimony telluride. You already see there's a wide range of different structures we have to incorporate and uh, using spend quite a lot of time actually building the reference data set that we can use to represent all these compounds. So you see here um, in, in color coding on the left, you see some crystalline phases on the right, there's the disordered ones. And you see in the center of this map, this is a structure map. So, so things that are similar are close on the map. It's a um, an embedding of, of distances between structures. Um, you see little snapshots here, for example, that represent the phase transition going from um, amorphous to crystalline. And it took quite a while to, to build this data set. But once you have it, you go and say, now I can go and fit um, interatomic potentials that describe these sorts of materials. To show you what that looks like in practice, I'm showing you something that was actually done with quantum mechanics. So this is an ab initio MD study we published um, last year, containing 1,008 atoms going from the disordered red phase to the um, ordered crystalline in yellow. Um, and this is uh, now something that, that of course has been done um, a few times. We, we first checked that our machine learning model can do the same thing. So you see these things are basically, um, you know, they, they, they look quite the same, but the one on the left took, took about half a year to run and the one on the right took a few days. So that was, that was nice. Um, if you are able to you know, describe this in such a fast way, you could go and do more than a single switching between one zero and one one, but you could test, for example, what happens if you apply multiple pulses. This is interesting to um, colleagues in in uh, device engineering who want to build devices out of these materials. Um, we can do these are still a thousand eight atoms, so it's quite small systems. Um, so our next step was going up to to the length scale of real devices and saying, can we actually describe much bigger systems? This is called a mushroom uh, device because you take a piece of the material, you put a heater at the bottom, you heat it at the bottom, and then it melts locally. So this is this is what people in the phase change field use to build uh, prototype devices. And we can now describe this melting process 
in fully atomistic simulations using the machine learned model, we can go and extract temperature profiles. If you're an engineer, you would think this is looking like a finite element method simulation, but it is actually not. It's from the fully atomistic um, molecular dynamics. And we say, okay, if we go up even further, um, can we reach the length scale that's relevant to actual devices? And the answer is yes, we can go to that length scale. This is a um, called a cross point memory architecture here on the left. You've got the active bit, which encodes your one and zero, and there's a lot of threshold switching, electrodes, contacts. But but what is really relevant is here this kind of bit, which stores your ones and zeros. So we can describe in these simulations, for example, going from the one, uh, that's the ordered phase in yellow, to a disordered phase in red. And again, we can make a little video. And see, we start heating this thing at the bottom, and then the heat sort of moves through the system, and you see how the whole bit switches. Um, so the the exciting thing here, again, this is in, in some way, this is still a proof of concept is we've done one, one switch. And in fact, you want to do many of them. Um, but we think this is an example of how you can now describe nanoscaled devices at the actual length scale of the device. And that is really, I think, a qualitative change from making simple models to making much more realistic ones. And we're very excited about seeing where this where this can go next. Um, Okay, so I could basically stop the talk here and say these machine learning potentials are now here. They've arrived in computational material science. I've shown you two examples from our um, group and collaborators. Of course, there's many other um, things going on in the field. And we could say, okay, you know, that's, this is great. Um, let's let's celebrate. Um, but of course, I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was uh, promising a 45-minute talk, so we have some time left. Mm -hmm. And um, I um, I want to switch gears a bit for the rest of the talk and talk a bit about where, where I think are some exciting directions for future work in this area. And also where are some um, methodological challenges that allow us to maybe look at even more complicated systems and run even faster simulations and be more accurate in the future. So my first, um, again, sort of claim I want to make here and also underpin with some results is that I think data themselves are becoming much and much more central um, in the development of these machine learned potentials, right? So the question, what kind of data do we feed and how do we work with these data? And if I'm looking back at this picture here, right? What kind of points do I choose to represent my material as it gets more and more complex? That is actually an ongoing question. And that is also important for us to make sure we, we don't um, spend uh, too much time on, on computing resources. So um, if I make this picture even simpler, I could say, well, there's sort of the left-hand side, which is the data, and the right-hand side, which is the very simplified sketch of a machine learning model. And for the remainder of this talk, I will just uh, focus on the left-hand side here. So what is what is sort of interesting in data sets for atomistic machine learning? Um, in fact, we're not, of course, the first people to, to think about this. Um, and this is a paper from, uh, this is sort of sketching the idea from a paper from 2019, um, and uh, one of the authors of this paper, uh, Alexander Isaiev, was actually, I think, a visiting professor here not too long ago. So it's a it's a very nice sort of hat tip to what they've done. What what they showed is you can, um, if you want to machine learn very high level quantum chemical data that are very expensive to come by, you can you know, take a machine learning model, train it on cheaper data from, from density functional theory, for example, and then you take your model that you've trained here in, in gray and you specialize it on higher level data. You have fewer of these data points, but they're higher quality. And this is called transfer learning. So you start with this model and you transfer the information over. Um, now this is now well known and you know, this paper has uh, hundreds of citations, rightfully so. And there's, there's a lot of other groups looking at uh, transfer learning. Um, what I want to show you here is another idea that um, we worked on with uh, Joe Morrow, who's one of our DFIL students um, a while ago. So um, we're doing something here we're calling indirect learning or teacher-student models. So the idea here is a bit different. We say we, we, we build a machine learning potential as normal, you see this cartoon, and imagine we have a, an accurate model, but it's still quite expensive to run, it's quite big. Um, so can we use that <clears throat> to create lots more data and fit a faster model? And this is called sort of the student model that learns from the teacher. Um, what does this mean? So again, to, to go with the wiggly lines here and to say, we normally go and take quantum mechanical calculations. We fit 
a potential that this is what everyone in the community is doing. Um, what we're doing now is we're taking this first potential and calling it method one and creating a lot more structures that are representative of the problem I'm trying to describe. Right, so I'm adding many more points on this potential energy surface. You see here all these little dots, but I'm only adding them in a smaller region. Okay, so I don't want a model that can do all of the things that my teacher can do. I want one specific task, and I want to be very good at that task. So this is the um, what we call the indirect fit. Um, in this case, we are using um, a model called Silicon Gap 18, as we call it. This is a sort of one of the this is Currently, I think the state of the art in, in modeling silicon, I've just shown you a video done with GAP18, um, but it's still comparably slow. And then we're using a faster class of things, moment tensor potentials. You could use any other technique in principle, um, but we found these to work very well. Um, also to show you another structure, so again, sort of similar structures are close together. You see these blue points here that show you this wide range of different configurations that are in the training data set for silicon GAP18. And then you see, these points here, that's what our student model is learning. So we're interested in the transition from amorphous to um, to fully disordered to crystalline. Um, I've just shown you the video. So we want to reproduce that. Um, the first thing you do is you check the performance of these methods. And now we're testing basically how does this indirect learning approach in red compare to the control experiment where we just say, just take the data directly and learn them like everyone else would do. And if you look at those curves, you're plotting sort of the, the error of the model versus the computational cost of these student potentials. We can make a few of them with different quality settings. So it's one nice aspect of MTPs. You can you can tune the accuracy by saying how how flexible should the model be. So on the right, it's getting more accurate and more, more flexible. Um, and you was able actually compared to the teacher model, that's M1, all these do okay, right? They, they look fine. If we test how well they learn the teacher model itself, you say actually, you know, they, they reproduce it to very high accuracy. And if you're working in atomistic simulations of complicated materials, 10 millivi per atom is actually really good for a for a disordered structure. So you wouldn't be able to tell from these plots, okay, you know, which which of these methods is now best. Um now I said before we 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 wrote this thing about sort of validating potentials, and this is something generally that we spend a lot of time doing. We want to check whether the results of the models are physically reasonable, whether they make sense. Um, so we tested this for this series of potentials you see. Um, I'm not going to go in detail, but what we're showing here is basically how simple hexagonal like the structures are as we squeeze them. Um, the dashed uh, black line is the video I've just shown you. That's gap 18. That's the reference. And we want to basically come as close as we can to that simulation. And you see that for some of these models, um, you see the red one here at level 16. This is a reasonably cheap model. And still, the orange line looks very close to that one here. And if you look at what these configurations look like, you see again a sort of a crystalline um, sample. Um, you see the blue one here has a line that sort of rapidly drops down. And that's because the simulation has failed. So it's produced something that's not physical. This is something like FCC. You don't expect FCC silicon at that density. Um, some simulations even sort of give you complete nonsense. And again, some others look right. And if you look closely, you see all these orange lines actually end up where they should be. They all give you polycrystalline samples. Whereas the other ones, which are directly fitted, don't always do that. And it's not quite, even if you go to a very high level, it might still fail numerically. Right. So what I'm saying here is it's really, really important to check that your models are not just accurate, but also robust. Don't just look at numerical errors, but also at physical behavior. In return, now that we have this model at level 16, where we said this is actually we're happy with how it behaves, we can go and go even bigger. This is the simulation I've just shown you with 100,000 atoms. This is now a million. Right. So we've got a million at, uh, atoms of amorphous silicon. We can do the compression, look at the structure of the grains. Um, we can also, this is something we've just, um, recently pre-printed, um, we can look at the defects. I said before, you know, there's a few atoms which have either three or five neighbors and they're quite important. So you can go and analyze the distribution, the local structure of these things. Um, you can look at the atomic energies that come out of your machine learning model. And you see this, those curves here, right? They are based on many thousand individual defects. So there's no broadening, there's no, this is really just a histogram. Um, so I have, you know, over 10,000 defects of one type 
um, and about 6,000 of the other type in the structure. Um, we can go and look at the connection between the structure and the energetics. Um, and there's lots of lots of more information you can try and tease out from this million atom simulation. Okay. Um, the second thing that I think is exciting is uh, an idea we're, we're referring to this as synthetic data. And this is actually a thing that's quite common in, in machine learning research. Um, you say, can you build sort of artificially made data that are much cheaper to generate? Um, so we're trying this idea here um, for atomistic machine learning, saying that this is frozen. There we go. So, um, so as we said before, we we are learning from quantum mechanical methods. We're taking structures. We're learning energies and forces, and uh, that that's sort of again what everyone in the community is doing. Um, but we could go and say, use that machine learning model to create a much larger data set. And we call this a synthetic data set. So it's made with a method that approximates the ground. It's not the exact thing. It's not as exact as quantum mechanics but it allows us to build lots and lots of data and it allows us to run large scale computational experiments. Um, this means computer experiments. And when I give a talk um, in chemistry, I have to add a disclaimer and say, we don't go to the lab and do experiments, but these are numerical experiments. Um, so we, we look at, um, in this case, again, this is a set of carbon structures, um, SP, SP2, SP3, um, because we've got an expert on carbon materials sitting here, so we'll, we'll talk a bit more about the, the, the details here. But what it does is it, it tries to reflect um, uh, lots of different environments in this data set. So we've, we've built this data set of about two, uh, 22, 23 million environments, uh, which is open source. You can go and download it and do your own tests. Um, first thing we did is just test whether um, standard um, regression techniques can, can learn the atomic energies in this structure. Um, you see here in blue, I'm not going in detail, but in blue, we're testing sort of a Gaussian process regression. This is a kernel-based method. It's very good with small data sets, but then it levels off at some point. Um, we've got neural networks here, which uh, are not as efficient for small data sets, but they get better with large data sets. So just to give you a sense of, of system sizes and numbers of data points, typically when you're working with specialized quantum mechanical data sets, you'll have you know, maybe 10,000 data points in, in our area, sort of uh, inorganic materials. We typically train, typically train potentials for a couple of hundred thousand environments. But what we're really trying to explore here is very large data sets, right? So what if you have millions and millions of atoms? How do these things behave? The one exciting thing you can do um, is you can use these data to pre-train neural networks. Again, this is something that's quite common in machine learning research that you say, you know, you, you have a neural network that instead of directly training it, you can pre-train it with some suitable data and then you fine tune it or specialize it on the data you wanted to know. And this is what we're doing here with our synthetic data set. And so we take some network, rather than training it directly, um, we're going to pre-train it on a much bigger set of synthetic data. We're teaching it how to describe this synthetic set. And um, we just look at the, the way how, this, how these neural networks have now learned the atomic energies in our synthetic set. Um, you see that well, if, if we directly train on quantum mechanical data, it doesn't correlate very well with um, the method we've used for labeling. If we if we then do the pre-training, of course, it, it absolutely reproduces, or absolutely but quite well reproduces the values in the um, synthetic set. But then once we go and specialize it on quantum mechanical data, it still looks much better than the one here on the left. And then the, it, it doesn't work with small data sets. So you need to basically go to uh, about, Hundred thousand, a million atoms to have a, a, an effect. So this is just a sort of baseline performance. If you don't get below that, it's not worth it. But if you have large data sets, it does help. And you can show that if you pre-train this model, um, you get this is the probably central result from that. Uh, that's called a learning curve. So we're testing the behavior of the model as a function of how many quantum mechanical data points we needed to train. And so purple is the, the sort of standard approach. Red is the pre-training and fine-tuning. So it means that either your learning curve moves down, which means that your model gets more accurate at the same cost, or it moves to the left, which means that you need fewer data points to get the same accuracy. So both are usually nice. Um, and to, to put in this kind of cartoon language again, I've shown you Joe's indirect 
learning work here. And um, here is this kind of synthetic pre-training that uh, John and others in my group are um, developing. So we say basically you have a data set, create lots of synthetic data, pre-train on that, and then you train. That's the difference between these two, if you look at the uh, pictures sort of side by side. Um, this is a proof of concept for atomic energies, but you can do a similar thing actually for interatomic potential. So this is um, a preprint currently on archive where we've shown the effect of this kind of pre-training for a method called NECWIP. That's one of the state-of-the-art um, force field architectures that people use for molecules and materials. Um, so you see in black, that's the sort of the normal approach where you just feed it a number of structures. And then um, in, in sort of increasingly red, uh, data points, we have more and more pre-training structures that help the model pick up early on what, what um, these energies and forces should look like. And we see something called positive transfer, so it does benefit from the pre-training and more so if you have more data points at the start. Um, you can do some, again, numerical experiments here and say, for example, what is the um, role of different um, pre-training approaches? So if you have different types of data to pre-train your model, they do differently well at that task, there was a, a very interesting paper at NeurIPS last year where um, colleagues showed um, uh, um, positive trends, among many other interesting things with, with empirical potentials. Um, and you see that, yes, empirical potentials do help, but uh, we, we've seen that actually quantum, sort of close to quantum mechanical accuracy data can, can presumably help even more with this kind of pre-training task. Um, still lots to do, but, but we think it's an interesting direction. Um, you can um, look at how it affects sort of simulations inside and outside of the scope of the training. So what we have here is, a, again, a structure map of the of this general synthetic data set in, in, in greenish. And then we said, what if we just take a couple of carbon? And I've shown you at the start, right, these carbon tubes. Um, so it's a much more specialized data set, um, but still we can see that it makes the um, model better in this area. It also shows that uh, you lose less accuracy if you're looking at structures out of the scope. So if you test on the entire thing, if you only train it to, to no carbon nanotubes, um, it's, it's going to be quite poor for the rest of all the sort of wonderful diversity that carbon can make structurally. Um, but you can, get, um, you can get a bit better performance with the fine tuning. And to make this point more clear, um, what we're talking about here is actually not, not just the accuracy, but the robustness again. So what we've done here is to take a structure. This is some disordered carbon structure, just an example. Um, we took this and we ran molecular dynamics on the structure with a potential that had only seen carbon nanotubes. Now you can imagine what happens if your neural network has only seen one specific type of structure and you try to run it on this, yeah, it will do um, very strange things and atoms will just fall into each other and it's not very good. It's, it, it's, it's clear that it can't, well, it's not trained to do this thing, right? It's, it's extrapolating. So it's not the fault of the method. It's just, we've put the wrong data in. But interesting enough, if you pre-train your model and then fine tune it afterwards, right? On the same data set, you see that it doesn't do very strange things anymore. You still see lots of threefold connected atoms in white, a few uh, here in two, these are two uh, SP, SP carbons. Um, the SP4 has disappeared, uh, SP3, sorry, fourfold. Um, but we don't see any physical um, failure. And I think this is another important thing with this pre-training approach. Not just do you improve the training process, but you can maybe make models a bit more, more robust and um, generally useful. Okay, so yeah, as it is on, on archive currently, um, but uh, there's probably lots of interesting things to do in that area. Um, the third part is again to do with data sets for atomistic ML, but in a slightly different angle. And this is a um, collaboration between uh, colleagues at several UK universities that we've published recently where we played some part. Um, and that's sort of making um, ab initio molecular dynamics faster with machine learned acceleration. Um, this is uh, now, what I'm showing you here is for the electronic structure code CASTEP, um, which is developed in the UK, which is which can be used freely for, for academic purposes. Um, and where um, we said, basically, we have the um, sort of the standard approach of taking ab initio molecular dynamics. And um, it just is a cartoon here. You take your structure, you solve the electronic structure problem, calculate forces on the atoms, move the atoms according to these forces, 
and then check have I done enough steps? No, I, I go back and calculate the forces again. So this is called up initial MD, and this is what everyone in the field is is using. It's many people are using. Um, so what we're looking at here is what if you what if you build machine learned acceleration into that process? So as you go through the molecular dynamic steps, right, you have some some logic that says do I want to use a machine learning model instead? Do I want to use the forces that I've computed to train a model as I go? And then maybe let the model take over at some point when it's accurate enough, right? So that way I could massively speed up the um, molecular dynamics simulation. There is, of course, um, so we're not the, the first people to show this. There is another very popular um, DFT software um, where this has been shown already in back in 2019 and very successfully used and you can sort of, this is, I think, um, is a very promising direction in, in general. Um, so what you can do with that, if you assume that you have an accelerator that works and it, that speeds up your calculations, you could you could directly accelerate um, the calculation within the up initial code, for example, CASTEP. So you could say, you know, you have something that speeds up CASTEP as you go, and you can make a direct MD simulation with a few hundred atoms much faster. Actually, you can also go and take these potentials that are being fitted by the approach, take them out and run them as a standalone potential. So you could then you know, plug them into an external engine. We use a code called LAMPS, um, depending on what your area is, you might use others. But uh, again, you could take these potentials, you could take them out, you can combine them with existing ones and then run much larger simulation. This is an example of 10,000 atoms just drawn for scale again to give you a sense of what you might be able to do. How does it work very briefly? So in this case, what we do is we have a um, um, a decision-making code that uh, written by, by Tamas Stenchel in, in Cambridge, um, who goes and, and checks every now and then, are we still reproducing the, um, the quantum mechanical data? So we're checking on the quantum mechanics itself every now and then. If um, it passes the test, then we go and just continue. If it doesn't pass test, we have to update our model. And you can do this in a sort of with a fixed interval, do it every n number of steps, or you can actually adapt your checking interval to how well it does. So if it does poorly, it needs to do many checks. If it does better, it gets sort of gets to run loose. And this is this is an example here of such simulations. So you see a few times early on it's it's crossing this threshold that we've set. And says this this now creates a refit. This creates a refit. And then at some point your points will be below the line and it just keeps running and keeps being much faster. Um, again, as I said, validation is important. So we've checked this approach and um, this is uh, work by, by Zach and Makach in, in, in my group, um, looking at different types of disordered carbon. So actually carbon is a great test case. It's got lots of different structures, diamond-like, graphite-like, open pores, all sorts of things. So Zach built this whole data. So again, this is openly available. You can use it to test your models. And uh, we said we, we were going to run this CASTEP accelerated MD, um, this gap accelerated CASTEP, um, at this one point here, right? So, so you get a quite good um, description of energetics. You get reasonable forces. Again, this is for very disordered structures. So the forces will look will look very uh, the errors will look very high if you you study individual molecules. But for for that kind of simulation, it's actually it's similar to to the um, the um, one I'm gonna ah, yeah, there it is. This is this is uh, gap seventeen. So this is a carbon potential. Um, it's uh, probably no longer state of the art accuracy, but it does reasonably well. It does the physics all right, and uh, so we're comparing it here to that. This model here has only seen data at that point during the iterations, right? So so for very different types of carbon structures, this error is quite poor, and this shows you that this potential is kind of tailor-made for one application. We said we want to run a molecular dynamics for this specific problem. This one up here is what we would call a generally applicable potential, right? It has seen lots of different carbon structures, different parameters. So it's good over this whole range of, of settings. Um, so it really depends on what you want. This one at the top took a long time to develop, I noticed um, from experience, because uh, I spent a lot of time on it. Um, the one at the bottom you can run essentially on autopilot. Um, it's not going to be as universal, but it is quite quick to use. And we hope that that's going to be interesting, not just for our community of people who actually develop these methods and test them, but also for users. I don't want to know all the details. I want to just have a fast accelerator that, that does this. Um, so again, sort of the last cartoon and also the last slide. Um, 
I think more generally where, where I think data are developing. I said it's becoming a more central field. And I think actually um, it's going to maybe not diverge, but, but develop in two different directions in the years ahead. Um, one direction that I think is really, really cool is this um, the mainstream models for a specific purpose that you can now almost automatically get from on the fly acceleration. I've shown you results for Custop. Um, other colleagues are working on other codes and this is this is very um, exciting. Um, you can take these data and you can fit ML models for a specific purpose very quickly, very easily and do new science with these things. The other direction, um, and I'm kind of uh, G here and saying these are foundation uh, models because this is a term that often is used in, in ML research. So this is sort of the contrary viewpoint. You say, I have the time to build a very general, very useful data set that I could use to fit a general purpose machine learning model. And this could be taken off the shelf. You don't have to um, interact with it anymore. You just take it and run your simulation out of the box. You could go and distill your data set. So basically take just a part of the data set that you really need for a specific problem. And you might then fit a much faster model, a bit like the teacher student models I've shown you. Um, and similarly, you could go from a complicated machine learning model to a simpler one. Um, this would be referred to as distillation. So you make a, a more efficient, smaller model for a single purpose. So depending on what you want to do. And I'm quite excited to see where, where the role of data will develop in the years ahead in this in this rapidly moving field. Okay, so um, very briefly, just to summarize, um, I've tried to convince you that, that machine learned interatomic potentials of force fields are increasingly popular. Um, we said in, in 2019, we had a um, progress report saying these are emerging tools and they're now, I think, getting more and more uh, widely adopted. Uh, I've shown you this, this tutorial paper here we have on validating machine learning models. Um, I've talked a bit about how I think data sets are getting more and more central in this field and are becoming a, a part of methods development. If they are not already, they're certainly um, becoming that now. I've shown you these sort of synthetic data and other um, results from our group. But of course, again, we're not the only people who work in this field. There's lots of exciting stuff uh, going on there. And then the last bit is um, with these new techniques, we're able to really better understand complicated models. This sort of brings me full circle. As I said at the start, we want to understand the microscopic properties of complicated materials. These are the tools that allow us to do it. And so in our group, we're interested mainly in amorphous materials. We want to understand the fundamentals, shown the silicon compression, with other materials that just haven't been fully understood so far. Um, and also we're interested in linking that to actual uh, like real life applications. For example, the question, how can you understand what's going on in these memory devices that I've shown you at the end? So um, yeah, it is a very exciting time, both methodologically in terms of new tools um, and also in terms of, of possible new new applications in the future. Um, and with that, I'd like you yeah, to say thank you very much again. Um, first of all, to uh, Anya, the whole team here for hosting is really a pleasure to be here and be able to talk to, to uh, hopefully many of you today. Um, like to yeah, acknowledge um, collaborators. Uh, my group over in Oxford is a quite recent photo. There's a uh, few people who have joined us since, few people who have graduated. Um, let's thank the funders who make all this possible. And uh, yeah, all of you for your kind attention. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>